The Future of Calculus The title of this chapter might raise a few eyebrows among those who believe that, that calculus is finished. How could it have a future? It's over now, isn't it? This is something you hear surprisingly often in mathematical cycles. According to this narrative, calculus will get a bang. Thanks to the breakthrough of Newton's of Newton and Leibniz. Their discoveries sparked a gold rush mentality in the 100, eh, 1670s, a period marked by playful, almost giddy exploration during which the golem of infinity was allowed to run wild. By giving it free reign, mathematicians produce a raft of spectacular results but also, but also generated a lot of nonsense and confusion. So, in 1800s, the next, the next few generations of mathematics, a more rigorous lot, brought the golem back into its, in, in, into its cage. They expunged infinity and infinitesimal from calculus, so up for the foundation of the subject, and finally clarified what limits, derivatives, integrals, and real numbers actually meant. By around 1900, the moving up operation was complete. To my kind, that vision of calculus is far, is far too blinkered. Calculus is not the work of Newton and Leibniz and their successors. It started much earlier than that. It started much earlier than that, and it's all going strong today. Calculus, to me, is defined by its credo to solve a hard problem about anything continuous, slice it into infinitely many parts, and solve them. By putting the answers back together, you can make sense of the original whole. I've called this credo the infinite, the infinity principle. The infinity principle was there from the beginning in Archimedes' work on curve shapes, and it was there in the scientific revolution in Newton's, in Newton's system of the world, and it's you and it's with us today in our homes, uh, our jobs, in our, and in our cars. It helped give us GPS cell phones, lasers, and microwave ovens. The FBI used it to compress millions of fingerprint files. Alan Cormack used it to create the theory of CT scanning. Both the FBI and Cormack solved a hard problem by resembling it from the simple parts, wavelets for fingerprints, sign waves for CT. From this point of view, Calculus is a collection of ideas and methods used to study anything, any pattern, any curve, any motion, any natural process, system or phenomenon that change smoothly and continuously and hence is grist from the infinite principle. This broad definition goes far beyond the calculus of Newton and Leibniz to include its de descendants. Multivariable calculus Ordinary differential equations, partial differential equations, Fourier analysis, complex analysis, and, other, and any other part of higher mathematics where limits, derivatives, and integral appear. Feel this, this way, feel this way, calculus is not over. It's a hungry as ever. But I'm in the minority here, actually a minority of one. None of my college, colleges in the math department will agree that all of this is calculus and for good reason, it would be absurd. Half the courses in the curriculum will have to be renamed, along with calculus 1, 2, and 3, we now have calculus 4, 2, 38. No, not very descriptive, so instead, we give, differ we give different names of each of, of each of sort of calculus and obscure the incontinuity among them, we slice the whole of calculus into small into its smallest consumable parts. That's ironic 
or perhaps fitting, given that calculus itself is about sizing continuous things into parts to make them easier to understand. Let me clear, I have no objection to all the different cause of name. Cause names. All I am saying is that slicing can be misleading when it makes us forget that forget that the parts belong together, that they are all part of something bigger. My goal is the my goal in this book has been so has been to show calculus as a whole to give a feeling it for its beauty, unity and grandeur. What then might the future house for calculus? As they say, prediction is always difficult, especially about the future, but I think it's safe to assume that several trends are likely to be important in the year ahead. This include new applications of calculus to the social sciences, music, the arts, and the humanities, ongoing, ongoing application, of, application of calculus to medicine and biology, coping with the randomness inherent in finance, economic, and the weather, calculus in the saving of big data, and vice versa, continuing challenge of nonlinearity, chaos, and complex systems, the evolving partnership between calculus and computers, including artificial intelligence, pushing the boundaries of calculus in the quantum realm. This is a lot of ground to cover, rather than saying a little about each of the topics mentioned here, I will focus on a few of them after a brief foray into the differential geometry of DNA, where the mystery of curves meets the secret of life. We will consider some case studies that I that I hope you that I hope you'll find philosophically provocative. This include the challenges to insight and prediction caused by the rise of chaos, complexity theory, com computers, and artificial intelligence for all of that to make sense. However, we will need to review the fundamentals of nonlinear dynamics, examining the context will allow us to better appreciate the challenges ahead. The writing number of DNA. Calculus has traditionally been applied in the hard sciences like physics, astronomy, and chemistry, but in recent decades, it has made inroads into biology and medicine in fields like epidemiology, population biology, neuroscience, and medical imaging. We've seen examples of mathematical biology throughout two throughout st our story, ranging from the use of calculus in predicting the outcome of facial surgery to the modeling of HIV as it battles the, the, the immune system. But all, but all those examples were concerned in, with some aspect of the mystery of change, of change the, the, modern, the most modern obsession of calculus. In contrast, the following example is drawn from the ancient Mysteries, mystery of course, which was given new life by a puzzle about three-dimensional path of DNA. The puzzle had to do with how DNA, an enormously long molecule that contains all the genetic information needed to make a person, is packaged in cells. Every one of, our, of your 10 trillion or so cells contains about two, met, about two meters of DNA. If late end to end, that DNA would reach to the sun and make dozens of, th of times. Still, a skeptic might argue, might argue that this comparison is not as impressive as it sounds. It merely reflects how many cells each of us, each of us has. A more informative comparison is with the size of the cell's nucleus, the container that holds the DNA, the diameter of a typical nucleus is about 5 million of a meter and it is therefore 400,000 times smaller than the DNA that has to fit inside it. The comparison factor is equivalent to stuffing 
20 miles of uh, string into a tennis ball. On top of that, the DNA can be stuffed into the nucleus haphazardly. It must not, it mustn't get tangled. The packaging has to be done in all of the in end of the revision so that so the DNA can be read by enzyme, enzymes and translated into the proteins needed for the maintenance of the cell. Other packaging is also important so that DNA can be copied neatly when the cell is about to divide. Evolution solve the packaging problems with spools. The same solution we use when we need to store a long piece of thread. The, the, DNA, cell, the, the DNA in cells is one about a round molecular spools made of specialist proteins and called histones. To a shift with the compaction, the spools are linked end to end like bits on a necklace, and then the necklace is coiled with gob like fibers that are themselves coiled into chromosomes. These coils of coils of coils compact the DNA enough to fit it into cam characters of the nucleus. But spools were not nitrous or gene with no nitrox original solution to the packaging problem, the earliest creatures on Earth were single-celled organisms that lacked nuclei and chromosomes. They had no spores, just as today's bacteria and viruses done. In such cases, the genetic material is compacted by a mechanism based on geometry and, on geometry and elasticity. Imagine pulling a rubber band type and then twisting it from one from from one end until from one end when holding it between the within your fingers at first each successive turn of the rubber band introduces a twist then twist accum then twist accumulate the rubber band remains suddenly buckles into the into the third dimension it begins to coil and on itself as if writhing in pain the construction the this construction Cause the rubber band and bounce up and compact itself. Then I does the same thing. This phenomenon is known as supercoiling. It prevalent in circular loops and the of DNA. Occur although we tend to picture DNA as a strike helix with with three ends. In the very circumstances, it closes it closes on itself from one to form a cycle. When this happens. It's like taking off your belt, putting a few teeth in it, and then and then marking it, it close again. After that, the number of twists in the belt cannot cannot change. It is locked in. If you try to, to if you try to twist the belt somewhere all along its along its length without taking it off, counter twist will form counter twist will form elsewhere to compensate. There is a conservation, conservation law at work here. The same thing happens when you stop a garden horse by peeling it on the floor with many coils stacked on, stack on top of each other. When you try to pull the horse out straight, it twists in your hand. It, it twists in your hands. Coils convert to, to twists. The conversion can also go in the in the other direction from twist to coils as when a rubber band reach when twisted the dna of primitive organisms make uh, makes us of this writing certain enzymes can cut dna twist is twist it and then close it back up then the dna relaxed uh, then when when dna when the dna relax Relaxes it, it twists to lower its energy. The conservation law forces it to become more supercoiled and therefore more compact. The resulting path of the DNA molecule no longer no longer lies in a plane. It writes about in three dimensions. In the early 1970s, an American mathematician named Brock Fuller gave the first mathematical description of this three-dimensional construction of DNA. He invented a quantity that he dubbed the writing the, the writing number of DNA. He derived so for he derived formulas 
for it using integrals and derivatives and prove certain theorems about the writing number the, that formalized the conservation law for twists and coils. The study of geometry and topology of DNA has been the thriving industry ever since. Mathematicians have used not have used knot theory and tangle calculus to elucidate the mechanisms of certain enzymes that twist DNA or cut it or introduce knots and links into it. Those, these enzymes alter the, topolo un alter the topology of DNA and hence are known of topoisomerases. They can break strands of DNA and reseal them and, and, and then are essential for cells to divide and grow. They have proved to be effective targets for cancer chemotherapy drugs. The, mechanisms, the mechanism of action is not completely clear, but it is true it, but it is thought that by blocking the action of topoisomerases, the drugs known as topoisomerase inhibitors can selectively damage the DNA of cancer cells, which causes them to commit cellular suicide. Good news for the patient, bad news for the tumor. In the application of calculus to supercalled DNA, the double helix is modeled as a continuous curve, as usual. Calculus likes the work with continuous objects. In reality, DNA is a discrete collection of atoms. There's nothing truly continuous about it, but to a good approximation, it can be treated as if it were a continuous curve like an ideal rubber band. The advantage of doing that is that the apparatus of elasticity, elasticity theory, and differential geometry to spin offs of calculus can then be applied to calculate how the entity forms when subjected to force from proteins from the environment and from interactions with itself. The larger point is that the larger point is that calculus is taking its usual creative license, treating modeling its approxima, approximate by, but useful. Anyway, it's the only game in the in town. Without an assumption of continuity, the infinity principle cannot be deployed. And without the infinity principle, we, ca we have no calculus, no differential geometry, and no elasticity theory. I expect in the future, we will see many more examples of calculus and continuous mathematics being brought to build on the inherently discrete players of bi biology, genes, cells, proteins, and, and, the, and the other authors in the biological drama, there is simply too much insight to be gained from the continuum approximation not to use it until we develop a new form of calculus that works as well from discrete systems as traditional calculus does for continuum ones. The infinity principle will continue to guide us in the mathematical modeling of living, this, of living things. Determinism and its limits. Our next two topics are the rise of nonlinear dynamics and the impact of computers on calculus. I've chosen them because they are so philosophically intriguing in their implications. They could alter the nature of prediction forever and lead to a new era in calculus and in science more generally, where human insight may begin to feed although science itself will still going on will still go on to clarify what i mean by this somewhat apocalyptic warning we need to understand how prediction is possible at all what it means classically and how our classical notions are being revised by discoveries made in the past several decades in the study of linearity chaos and complex systems early in 1800s, the French mathematicians and astronomer Pierre-Simon Laplace took the determinism of Newton's clockwork universe to its logical extreme. He imagined a godlike intellect now, now known as Laplace's demon that could keep track 
of all the positions of all the atoms in the universe as well as all the forces acting on them. If this intellect were also fast enough to, su to submit this data to analyze, to analysis, he got nothing would be uncertain and the future just like uh, just like the past would be present before it eye before its before its eyes as the turn of the 20th century approach this extremely this extreme formulation of the clockwork universe began to seem scientifically and philosophically untenable for several different reasons this was came from calculus and we have sofia kopalevskaya to thank for it Kovalevskaya was born in one was born in 1850 and grew up in the Aspartic family in Moscow. When she was 11, she found herself surrounded by calculus. Literally, one wall of her bedroom was peppered with notes, and from a, from a calculus course, his father and and had attended in in his youth. She later wrote that. She spent whole hours of my childhood in front of that mysterious wall, trying to make out even a single sentence, and find the other in which the page, the page ought to have followed and one another. She went on to become the first woman in history to earn a, to earn a PhD in mathematics. Although Kovalevskaya sought a flair for mathematics early on, Russian. Russian law prevented her from enrolling in college. She entered the marriage of convenience, which which causes ma which causes her much her much heartache in the in the years to come. But at least allowed allowed her to travel to Germany, where she impressed her professors as an extraordinary talent. Yet ever, yet even there, she was not officially allowed to attend their classes. She arranged to study privately with the analyst Karl Weierstrass, and at his recommendation was awarded a doctorate for solving several outstanding problems in analysis, dynamics, and partial differential equations. She eventually became a full professor at the University of Stockholm and taught there for eight hundred for and taught there and taught there for year for eight years before before dying from influenza at the age of, of 41. In 2009, the, the Nobel Prize winning author Alice Munro published a short story about her called Too Much Happiness. Kovalevskaya in Sykes on these limits of determinism came from her work on the, on the dynamics of rigid bodies. A rigid body is a mathematical abstraction of an object that can be bent or deformed all of its points are rigidly attached to one another. An example is a spinning top. It completely solid and composed of the infinitely many points and is therefore a more complicated mechanical object than the single point particles that Newton had considered. The motion of rigid bodies is important in astronomy and space science for describing phenomena ranging from the chaotic tumbling of Hyperion, a, a little potato shaped moon of Saturn, to the regular rotation of a space capsule or satellite. While studying rigid body dynamics, Kovalevskaya produced two major results. The first was an example of spinning top whose motion could be completely analyzed and solved, in the same sense that Newton had solved the two body problem. Two another such integrable tops were already known, but hers was more subtle and surprising. More important, she proved that no other solvable tops could exist. She had found the last one. All others from then on would be non-integrable, meaning that their meaning that their dynamics would be impossible to solve with Newtonian style formulas. It was a matter of of ins insufficient cleverness, she proved that there simply couldn't be any formulas of certain type in the jargon, a meromorphic function of time that could describe the motion of the top forever. In this way, she put limits on what calculus could do. If ever she, if even a spinning top could defy Laplace demand, there was no hope, even in principle, 
or find a formula for the fate of the universe. Nonlinearity. The unsolvability the Soviet Kovalevskaya discovered is related to a structural aspect of the equations for the top. The equations are non the equations are no nonlinear. The technical meaning of nonlinear not concern has not concern us here. For our purposes, all we need is a feel for the distinction between linear and nonlinear systems, which we can get by considering some harm examples for everyday life. To illustrate what linear systems are like, suppose two people try to wake themselves by stepping on the scale at the same time, just for the fun of it. The combined wake, the combined wake. Will be will be the sum will be the will be the sum of their individual wakes. That's because a scale is a linear device. The people wakes don't interact with ever, with each other or to do, or do anything tricky. What we need to be aware of, for example, the bodies no the bodies don't somehow conspire with each other to seem lighter or sabotage each other to seem heavier. They simply add up. On the linear simple, like a scale, the whole is the equal is equal to the sum of parts. That's the first key property of linearity. The second is that causes are proportional to effects. Imagine pulling on the string of an archer's bow. If it takes a certain amount of force to pull the string back a certain a certain distance, it takes twice as much force to pull it back by twice at distance by twice that distance cause and effect are proportional there's two properties the proportionality between cause and effect and the equality of the whole to the sum of the parts are the sense of what it means to be linear yet many things in nature are more complicated than things than this whenever parts of a system interfere or, or cooperate or co cooperate or compete with each other. There are non-linear interactions taking place. Most of everyday life is spectacularly non-linear. If you listen if you listen to your two favorite to your two favorite songs at the same time, you won't get double the pleasure. The same goes for consuming alcohol and drugs where the interaction effects can be deadly. By contrast, peanut butter and jelly are better together. They don't just then they don't just add up. They synergize. Nonlinearity is responsible to the richness in the world, for its beauty and complexity, and often is and often is inscrutability. For example, all of biology is nonlinear. So is sociology. That why that's why why the soft sciences are hard. And the last to be mathematics, because of non-linearity, there's nothing soft about them. The same distinction between linear and non-linear applies to differential equations, though in a less intuitive fashion. The only thing we need to say is that when differential equations are non-linear, as as they are for Kovalevskaya stops, they are extremely difficult to analyze, even since Newton. Mathematicians have avoided nonlinear differential equations wherever possible. They are seen as nasty and recalcitrant. In contrast, linear equations, linear differential equations, are sweet and docile. Mathematicians love them because they are easy. There's an enormous body of theory for solving them. Indeed, until until about the 1980s. The traditional education of an applied mathematician was almost entirely devoted to learning methods to exploit linearity. Years when spending math mastering Fourier series and other techniques tailored to the linear equations. The great advantage of linearity is that it allows for reductionist thinking. To solve a linear problem, we can break it down. To, the, to its simplest parts, solve each part, solve each part separately, and put the part and put the parts back together to get the answer. Four years, four years of his heat equation 
which was linear with the reductionist strategy he broke a complicated temperature distribution into sine waves figure out how each sine wave each sine wave would change on its own they recombine those sine uh, wave to predict how the overall temperature would change along the length of a heated metal rod the strategy works because the heat equation is linear it can be chopped into the bits into bits without losing its essence Sofia Kovalevskaya help us understand how different the how different the world appear, appears when we when we finally when we finally face up to non-linearity she real she realized that non-linearity places limits on human hubris when a system is non-linear it behavior can be impossible to forecast with formulas even though the behavior is completely determined in other words determinism does not play imply does imply predictably it took the motion of a top a child's plating to make us more humble about what we can ever how we can ever hope to know just in rest topic we can see more clearly why newton's hit at when he tried to solve the three body problem the, the that problem is inescapably nonlinear unlike the two body problem which can be massaged to become clear the two, the nonlinear wasn't the non the the nonlinearity wasn't caused by the leap from the from two from two two to three bodies it was caused by the structure of equations themselves for for two graviting bodies but not for three or more the nonlinearity could be eliminated by a felicitous felicitous broad choice of new variables in the differential equations it took a long time for the humbling implication for of nonlinearity to be fully appreciated mathematicians stress around for centuries trying to solve the three body problem and although problem and although and although progress was made no one managed to crack it completely in the late 100 in the late 1800s the french mathematician henry poincare thought he solved it but he made, but he was a mistake that but he made a mistake when he rectified his error he still can't he still couldn't solve the three body problem but he discovered something far more important the phenomenon that we now call chaos chaotic chaotic systems are finicky, are finicky. a little change in how they are started can make a big difference in where they end up that's because small changes in the initial conditions get magnified exponentially fast any tiny error of these two bands snowballs so rapidly that in the long term the system becomes unpredictable chaotic systems are not random they are deterministic and hence predictable in the short run but in the long run they are so sensitive to tiny disturbances that they look effect effectively random in many respects chaotic systems can be predicted perfectly well up to a time known as the predictable horizon before that the determinism of the system makes it predictable for example the horizon of predictably for entire solar solar system had been calculated to be to be about four billion years four times much shorter than that like the, like the single year it takes for our eyes to go around the sun everything behaves like clockwork but once we move up, we move past a few few million few million years all bets are off the subtle gravitational perturbations among all the bodies in the solar system accumulate until we can no longer focus the, the system accurately the, the existence of the predictable horizon and makes the point carry work point carries work before him it was thought that errors would go on linearly in time not exponentially if you double the time there be double the error with a linear with a linear god of errors involving the measurements could always keep pace 
with the desire for the longer for longer prediction but when errors go exponentially fast a system is said to have sensitive dependence on its initial condition the long-term prediction becomes impossible this is the philosophically disturbing messages message of scales it's important to understand it's important to understand what's new what's new about this people always knew that big complex systems like the weather were hard to predict this surprise was that something as simple as spinning top of three gravitating bodies was similarly unpredictable that was a shocker and uh, another blow to plus naive complex conflation of the, of determinism with predictability on the posi on the positive side vestige vestige of other assist with chaotic systems because of data because of their deterministic character Poincare developed new methods for analyzing non-linear systems including chaotic ones and found ways to extract some of the order hidden within within them instead of formulas and algebras he used pictures and geometry his qualitative approach uh, approach helped so to the the seeds from the modern mathematical fits of topology and dynamical systems we now have a much better understanding of order of order and chaos because of his seminal work Poincare, Poincare's visual approach to give an example of how Poincare's approach works consider the oscillation of a simple pendulum on the sort that Galileo studied using Newton's law of motion and taking note of the forces that the pendulum experiences as it swings we can do an abstract picture showing how the pendulum changes its angle and velocity from moment to moment the picture is essentially a visual translation of what what newton's law says what, what newton's law says there is no new content in the picture beyond what's already in the differential equation it's just another way of looking at the same information The picture looks like a map of weather pattern traveling across the countryside. On such maps, we see we see a rose showing in showing the local direction of propagation, which way the weather front will move instant by instant. This is the same kind of information that a differential equation provides. It's also the same kind of information given in dense instructions. Put your left foot here put your right foot here there such maps such a map is called a graph or vector field the little arrows on it are vector showing showing that the ang the angle and velocity of the pendulum are currently here this is where they should go a moment later the fact of it picture for the pendulum look like this before we interpret the picture please understand that it is up it is abstract in the sense that it's not showing the real, a realistic portrait of pendulum. The pattern of swirling a rose does not resemble a wig hanging from a string. It's not what a photograph of a pendulum would like would look like. Cartoons or such of of cartoons of such snapshots are shown be, below the fact of field picture to give you a feeling for what it means. Instead of a realistic depiction of the pendulum, the fact of field picture shows an abstract map of how the state of the pendulum changes from one moment to the next. Each point on the map represent a represents a possible combination of the pendulum's angle and velocity at an instant. The horizontal axis represents the pendulum's angle. The vertical axis represents its velocity at any moment. A knowledge of those two numbers angle and velocity define the dynamical state of the pendulum they provide the information we need to predict that predict what the angle and velocity of the pendulum will be a moment later and then a moment after that and so on all we need to do is follow the arrows 
The swiggling arrangement of the arrows near the center corresponds to a swiggling back and forth motion of the pendulum where it, it is hanging nearly and straight, uh, nearly and straight down. The wavy structure of the arrows on top and bottom corresponds correspond to a pendulum rotating vigorously on the top, whirling like a propeller. Newton, Newton never considered such wiggling motions, neither did Galileo. They were outside the rim of what could be calculated with classical method. With classical methods, yes, yet wiggling motions are plain to see on point carry picture. This qualitative way of looking at dynam at differential equations is not a step in every field where nonlinear dynamics arise from lesser physics to neuroscience. Neuro nonlinearity goes to work. Nonlinear dynamics can be intensely practical in the hands of the British mathematicians Mary Cartwright and John Littlewood when Carr's techniques contributed to, work, to the wartime defense of Britain, Britain against Nazi Arabs. In 1938, in 1938, the British government's Department of Scientific and Industrial Research asked the London Mathematical Society for help with a problem related to top secret developments in radio detection and ringing the technology known today as radar. Known today as radar. British government engineers working on the project had been perplexed by, no, perplexed by noisy radio oscillations they were observing in their amplifiers, especially when the devices were driven by high power, high frequency radio waves. The fear that something might be wrong with their equipment. The government, the government's call for help, call, for help caught current attention. She had already been studying, studying models of oscillation systems governed by similar, very objective, objectionable looking differential equations as she later described them. She and Littlewood went on to discover the source of erratic oscillations in the radar electronics. The amplifiers were nonlinear and they could respond critically if they were different to fast and to hard. Decades later, the physicist Freeman Dyson Record hearing Cartwright lecture on her work in 1942, he wrote. The whole development of radar in World War II depended on high power amplifiers, and it was a matter of life and death to have amplifiers that did what they were supp supposed to do. The soldiers were plugged with amplifiers the, that mis misbehaved and blamed the manufacturers for their erratic behavior. Cut work and little would discover that the manufacturers were not to blame. The equation itself was to blame. The insights of cut work and little would enable the government's engineers to work around the problem by operating the amplifiers in regimes where they behave more predictably. Cat White was, character, was characteristically, characteristically modest about her contribution. When she read what Dyson had written about her work, she scolded him for making too much of it. Dem, Dem Mary Cat White passed away in 1998 at the age of 97. 97. She, she was the first female mathematician elected to the Royal Society. She left strict instructions that no apologies were to be given at her memorial service. The alliance between calculus and computers. The need to solve differential equations in work time spurred the development of computers, mechanical and electronic brains. As, as they were sometimes called in those days, could be used, in, could be used to calculate the, the, the trajectories of rockets and cannon cells under realistic conditions by counting for complications like air resistance and wind reaction. Such information was needed by artillery officers in the field to, ha to help them hit their targets. All the necessary ballistic data 
were computed were computed ahead of time and compiled in standard tables and chart and charts. High speed computers were essential for this task. In a mathematical simulation, the computers could inch an idealist cannon cell forward on its flight flight path one small step at a time using the appropriate differential equation to update the cell position and velocity by one small increment after another proceeding to the solution by brute force thought and a robust number of additions. Only a machine could chuck forward relentlessly and perform all the necessary additions and multiplications quickly, correctly and tirelessly. The legacy of calculus in the in the folk is evident in the, in the names of some of the earliest com earliest computers. One um, one was a mechanical device called the differential analyzer. It, its job was to solve the differential equations needed to compute artillery fire firing tables. Another was the called another was called in ENIAC for electronic numerical integrator and computer. Here, the word integrator was used in the calculus sense as in doing the gas or integrating a differential equation. Completed in 1945, ENIAC was one of the first reprogrammable general purpose general purpose computers. Along with computing firing tables, it also used it also assessed the technical feasibility of a hydrogen bomb. Although Military application of calculus and nonlinear dynamics stimulated the development of computers. Many epistemy uses the uses were found for both the math and machine and the machines. In 1950s, scientists began to use them to solve problems arising in their own disciplines outside of physics. For example, the British biologist Alan Hodgkins and Andrew Huxley needed computers to co to help them understand how nerve cells talk to one another and more specific specifically how electric signals travel along nerve fibers. They perform painstaking experiments to calculate the flow of sodium and potassium ions across the membrane of a very big and experimentally convenient kind of nerve fiber. The giant action of squid and warp out empirically how this flows depended on the voltage across the membrane and how the voltage was altered by the following ions. But what they were not but what they were not able to do without computer was calculate the speed and shape of a nerve impulse as it traveled down an action. Calculating its motion requires solving a nonlinear partial differential equation for the voltage as a, as a function of time and space. Andrew Huxley solved it over the course of three weeks and a ha on a hand crank mechanical calculator. On 1963, Hodgkins and Huxley set a Nobel Prize for their discoveries about the ionic basis of how nerve cells work. The, their approach has been a big inspiration to all those interested in applying mathematics into biology. This is, this is your to be a god area for the application of calculus. This, with the with the help of Newton Newton style analytic models, point carry style geometric methods, and an and the best reliance of reliance of on computers, mathematical biologists are looking for and starting to make headway headway to on the different equations that govern hard rhythms a spread of epidemics, the functioning of the human system, the orchestration of genes, the development of cancer, and many other mysteries of life. We couldn't do it. We couldn't do any of it without calculus, complex systems, and the curves of high dimensions. The most serious limitation of Poincaré's approach has to do with the human brain, which can be, which can imagine space having a more having having more than three dimensions. Natural selection has tuned out nervous systems to perceive up and down, front and back, and, and left and right, the three directions of ordinary space. Try as we might, we can picture a fourth dimension, not in the sense of seeing it, 
in the mind's eye. With abstract symbols, however, we can try to deal with any number of dimensions very much in this case so how so as how. The XY plane taught us that numbers could be attached to dimensions. Left and right correspondent corresponded to the number X, up and down corresponded to the number Y. By including more numbers, we could include more dimensions for three dimension XYZ, XY and Z sufficient sufficient. Why not have one dimension of five? There were five there were still plenty of letters left. You may you may have had the time and it's the fourth dimension. Indeed, in Einstein's type, special and general theories of relativity, space and time are fused into a, sin, a single entity, space time, and represented in the four dimension mathematical arena. Roughly speaking, ordinary space gets ordinary space gets plotted on the first three axes and time get plotted on the fourth. This construction can be viewed as a generalization of two-dimensional XY plane of Verma and Descartes. And Descartes. But we are not talking about space-time. The limitation inherent in Poincaré's point point approach involves a much more abstract arena. It's a generalization of abstract states, abstract state space. We met when we look at the effect of it or a pendulum. In that example, we construct an abstract space with one axis for the pendulum's angle and another for its velocity at each instant. The angle and velocity of the swinging pendulum has certain values, hence the, at, the inst at, instant, at that instant, there is corresponding to a single point in the angle velocity plane. The arrows on that plane, the ones that look like dense instructions, dictated how the state changed from the instant to instant as determined by Newton differ Newton's differential equation for the pendulum. By following the arrows, we could forecast how the pendulum would move. Depending on where it started, it could oscillate back and forth, or it could wheel over the top. All of that was contained in the picture. The key thing to realize is that the pendulum state space has to dimension because two variable the pendulum's angle and its velocity were necessary and sufficient to predict its future. They gave us exactly the information we needed to predict its angle and velocity an instant later, and an instant after that, on and on into the future. In the sense, the pendulum is an inherently two-dimensional system. It has a two-dimensional state space. The curse of high dimensions arises when we consider when we consider systems more complicated than a pendulum. For example, let's take the problem that gave Newton a headache, a problem of three mutually, three mutually gravitating bodies. Its state space has 18 dimensions. To see why concentrate on one of the bodies at an instant it is located somewhere in ordinary three-dimensional physical space. Its location can therefore be specified by three, three, by three numbers x, y, z. It can also move in, in each of those three directions corresponding to three velocities. So, a single body requires six pieces of information, three coordinates of its location, plus three its velocity in different, in, the, in different directions. Those six numbers specify where it is, where it is and how it's moving. Multiply that six by each of the three bodies in the problem and now you have six times three equals 18 dimensions in state space. In state space. Thus, in point Carey's approach, the, state, the changing state of a system of three mutually gravitating bodies is represented by a single abstract point moving around in an 18 dimension space, the 18 dimensional space. At, as time passes, the abstract point traces out a trajectory analogous to the trajectory of a real comet or a cannonball, except this abstract trajectory lives in Poincaré's fantastic arena. Actin, the acting dimensional state space of the three-body problem. 
when we apply nonlinear dynamic to biology, we often find it necessary to imagine even higher dimensional spaces. For example, in neuroscience, we need to keep track of all the changing concentrations of sodium, potassium, calcium, chloride, and other ions involved in the nerve membrane equation of Harkins and Huxley. Modern fraction of the equations can involve hundreds of variables. Those variables represent the changing concentrations of ions in the nerve cell. In the nerve cell, the changing voltage across the cell membrane and the membrane's changing ability to conduct the various ions and allow them to pass into the cell or out of it. The abstract, st the abstract state space in this case has hundreds of dimensions. One of each variable, one for potassium concentration, another for sodium concentration, a third for touch, a, a fourth for sodium conductance, a fifth for potassium conductance, and so on. And at any given instant, all those variables take certain values. The Hartkitz Huxley equations of their generalizations give the variables their dense instructions and tell them how, the, how to move on their trajectories. In this way, the dynamics of nerve cells, brain cells, and the heart cells can be predicted sometimes with surprising accuracy with the help of computers to step the trajectory forward through the state space. The fruit of this approach are being used to study neural pathologies and cardiac arrhyth arrhythmias and to design better the free, the free relators. Today, ma today, mathematicians regularly think about abstract spaces having arbitrary numbers of dimensions. We speak about n dimensional space and we have developed geometry and calculus in, our, in, in any number of dimensions. As we saw in Chapter 10, Alan Cormack, the inventor of the theory behind CT scanning, wondering on, wondered how CT would work in four dimensions, purely out of intellectual curiosity. Great things have come from this period of pure adventure. When Einstein, need, need, when Einstein needed four-dimensional geometry for curve space and time in general relativity, he was pleased to learn it already existed thanks to Bernhard Riemann. Thanks to Bernhard Riemann, who had created it decades earlier for the purest math of mathematical reasons. So, there is a lot to be said for following one's curiosity in mathematics. It often scientific practical payoff payoffs that can be foreseen. It also gives mathematicians great pleasure for its own sake and reveals hidden connections between different parts of mathematics. For all these reasons, the pursuit of high higher dimensional spaces has been a vigorous part of mathematics for the past two hundred years. However, Although we have an abstract system for doing math in higher dim in high dimensional space, in high dimensional spaces, mathematicians still have trouble visualizing them. Actually, let me let me be more frank. We can we can visualize them. Our brains just aren't up to it. We aren't wired that, that way. That, that cognitive limitation deals a serious blow to a point carries program, at least in, dimension, in, in dimensions higher than 3. Its approach to nonlinear dynamics depends on visual intuition. intuition. If we can't picture what's going to happen in 4 or 18 or 100 dimensions, his approach can help us all that much. This has become a big obstacle to progress in the field of complex systems, when high dimensional spaces are exactly what we need to understand if we want to make sense of the thousands of biochemical reactions taking place in healthy life and in a healthy living cells, or explain how they go or in cancer. 
if we are to have any hope of making sense of cell biology using differential equations, we need to be able to solve those equations with formulas which Sofia Kovalevskaya so we cannot or picture them, which our limited brains would allow. Some of the mathematics, some of the so the mathematics of complex nonlinear systems is discouraging. It seems like it will always be hard, if not impossible, for anyone to make headway on the most difficult problems of our time, from the behavior of economies, societies, and cells to the workings of immune system, genes, brains, and consciousness. A further difficulty is that we, is that we don't even know if some of those systems have competence akin to those uncovered by Kepler and Galileo. Nerve cells apparently do, but what about economics? But what about economies or societies? In many fields, in many fields, human understanding is still in the pre-Galilean, pre-Keplerian phase. We have not, we haven't found the patterns. So, how can we find deeper theories that will give insight into those patterns? Biology and psychology and economics are not Newtonian yet, because they aren't even Galilean and Kleberian. We have a long way to go. Computers, artificial intelligence, and the mystery of insight. At this point, the computer triumphalists demand to be heard. With computers, they say, with artificial intelligence, all of these problems will, will fall. And that may be well too. Computers have long helped us, have long helped us in the study of differential equations, nonlinear dynamics, and complex systems. When Hodgkins and Huxley opened the door in 1950s to understand how nerve cell work, how nerve cells work. They solved the partial differential equations on a hand crank machine. When engineers at Boeing designed the 7x7 Dreamliner in 2011, they used supercomputers to calculate the lift and drag on the plane and the feature out how to prevent unwanted vibrations of its wing of its wings. Computers began as calculating machines, literally computers. But they are but they are now much more than that. They have achieved artificial intelligence of a sort. For example, Google Translate now does a surprisingly good job of providing idiomatic translations. And there are medical AI systems that diagnose diseases more accurately than the best human expert experts. Still, I don't believe anyone would say that Google Translate has insight into languages on the or that medical AI systems understand diseases. Could computer ever be insightful? If so, could they share their insights? with us about things we really care about, like complex systems, which are central to most of the treatises and sub-problems of science. To explore the case for the against the possibility of computer insight, consider how computer chess has evolved. In 1997, IBM's chess playing program Deep Blue managed to beat the, rain, the reigning human world chess champion Gary Kasparov in six game match. Although unexpected at the, at the time, there was no good mystery in this achievement. The machine could evaluate 200, 200 million positions per second. It did not. It didn't have insight, but it had raw speed. It never got tired. It never blunt. It, it never blundered in a calculation and it never forget what it ne was thinking a minute ago. Still, still it played like a, co like a computer, mechanically and materialistically. 
it could out come it could out come put Kasparov but he could not but he couldn't outthink it outthink him. The current generation of the world of the world's strongest chess programs with intimidating names like Stockish and Komodo still play in this in human style. They like to capture material they define like, like iron. But although they are far stronger than any human player, they are not creative or insightful. All the change with this with the rise of machine learning. On December 5, 20, 2017, the DeepMind team at Google stunned the chess, chess world with its announcement of a deep learning program called Alpha Zero. The program taught itself chess by playing millions of millions of games against itself and learning from its mistakes. In a, in a matter of hours, it became the best chess player in history. Not only could it easily defeat it, defeat all the human best the best all the best human masters, it did not even bother to try. It cast the reigning computer world champion of chess in a hundred game in a hundred game match against Toffees. A truly formidable program, Alpha Zero scored 28 wins in 72 and 72, 72 draws. It did not it didn't lose a single game. The scariest point is that Alpha Zero sought inside. It play a it played like no art like no computer ever has, intuitively and beautifully with a romantic attacking style. It played gambits and took risks. In some games it paralyzed Stockfish and tried with it. It seemed malevolent and sadistic and it was creative beyond beyond words. Playing moves no, no gunmaster or computer would ever dream of making. It had the spirit of human and the computer of machine. It was humankind's first glimpse of terrifying new kind of intelligence. Suppose we could unleash Alpha Zero or something like it, like it. Let's call it Alpha Infinity on the greatest unsolved problems in theoretical science. Problems of immunology and cancer biology on consciousness and consciousness. To continue the fantasy, support the Galilean and Kleberian patterns exist in the in this phenomena and arrive of and arrive for the peaking but only by an intelligence far, su far superior to ours. Assuming that such law exists, would the superhuman intelligence be able to work them out? I don't know. No one's know no one knows. And it all may be not because such laws may not may not even exist. But if they do, if the Alpha Infinity could find them, it would seem like an oracle to us. We'd sit at its feet and listen to it. We would not understand why it always right or even what it was saying. But we would could check its calculations against experiments of or observations and it would seem to know everything. We would be reduced to spectators, gaping in wonder and confusion. Even if it could explain itself, we would not be able to follow its reasoning. Uh, at that moment, the age of insight that began with Newton will come to a close, at least for humanity, and a new age of insight would begin. Science fictions, perhaps. Uh, but I think a scenario like this is not out of the question. In parts of mathematics and science, we are already experiencing the darks of insight. There are theorems to ha that have been proved by computers, yet no human being can understood, understand the proof. The theorems are correct, but we, are, but we have no insight we, we, into why. And at this point, the machines can explain themselves. Consider the famous long-standing math problem called the four-color map theorem. It says that under certain reasonable constraints, any map of contiguous countries can always be colored with just four colors and such, such that no two neighboring countries are colored the same. Look at a typical map of Europe and Africa or any other continent beside Australia besides Australia and you'll see what I mean. 
The fall of Carlock theorem was proved in 1977 with the help of a computer, but no human being could check all the steps in the argument, although the proof has been validated and simplified since then. There are, there are parts of it that unavoid that unavoidably entail brute force computation, like the way Compute, like the way computers used to play chess before Alpha Zero. When this proof came, came out, many working mathematicians were cranky about it. They already believed the four color theorem. They did not need any assurance that it was true. They wanted to understand what it was true, and this proof didn't help. Likewise, consider a 400 year old ge geometry problem posed by Johannes Kepler. It asks for the dancers, dancers way to play equal size squares in three dimensions, akin to the problem faced by grocers when they pack oranges in a crate. Will it be will, will it be most efficient to stack the squares in identical layers, one directly on top of another, or will it be better to stage the layers so that each square nestles? In the hollow form by our by folks others beneath it, the same way goes as take oranges. If so, is that picking the best possible one, or could some others, or could some other possibly irregular picking arrangement be denser? Be denser. Kepler's conjecture was the grocer's picking is the best, but this was not proved in nine. But this was not proved until nineteen. 98. Thomas Hals, Thomas Hales, with the help of his student Samuel Ferguson and 180,000 1, 1, lines of computer code, reduced the calculation to a large but finite number of cases. Then, with the help of brute force computation and ingenious algorithms, he pro his program verified the conjecture, the mathematical community commodities such we know we not know that the that the Kepler conjecture is true but we still don't, don't understand why we don't have insight nor could Hal's computer explain it to us but what about when we unleash alpha infinity on such problems a machine like that would come up with beautiful proofs as, uh, as beautiful as the chess game games that alpha zero played against Stockfish. Its, pro it, its proofs will be intuitive and elegant. They, they will be in the words of Hungarian mathematical, with the, in the words of Hungarian mathematicians, mathematician Paul Erdos, proofs take from the book. Erdos imagined that God kept a book with all the best proofs in it, saying that a proof was straight from the book was the highest possible praise. praise. It means that the proof revealed by any theory. It means that the proof was the proof revealed why a theorem was true. It did not mere plagiarism the reader into accepting with it with some ugly, difficult argument. I can imagine a day, not too far in the future, when artificial intelligence will give us will will give us proofs from the book. What will calculus be like then, and what will be and what will medicine like be like in sociology and politics.